Welcome back to Sora Financially. Welcome back to our channel. I'm here at the Deutsche Gold Messe in Frankfurt. My name is Kai Hoffman. I'm the at the JR Mining Guy on Twitter and the CEO of the Sora Financial Group. And I'm looking forward to hosting a fantastic roundtable discussion. Michael Howell on my right, uh, Cross Border Capital, and Deloitte Tigre, Independent Speculator. Thank you so much for joining us here in Frankfurt. It's good to pleasure. see everybody. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks. Fantastic. Great show, Kai. Thank you. Appreciate that. And to Michael, I had the pleasure of listening to your keynote already, Lobo Europe. Uh, in about uh, two hours, so really looking forward to that as well. But in the meantime, we get to have a fantastic discussion. We just had about 20 minutes of chat already before hitting the record button. And uh, I'm going to start with a, a general question, I think, and uh, direct it at both of you. Maybe, Michael, you can start start with it. But uh, how is the economy doing right now? And uh, what, what's uh, if you were to gauge it with a temperature, how hot is it right now? Well, I think the question, if the question is directed at the, at the world economy... I think the world economy is tepid. In other words, it's warm. It's probably getting hotter. Uh, I think if you look at the European economy, I think it's cold and it's becoming a bit more icy. Uh, so there's a real recession threat in Europe if Europe's not already in recession. I think as regards the US, I think it looks to me pretty much like uh, the period of the in the 1990s when the US economy never formally went into recession, but you saw a series of rolling recessions in different sectors. So I'd say the US economy is probably nearer to the world average in that regard. Do you have a different take or a similar take on this? Very concise. Uh, I'm on board. But I'm a little bit more negative, I would say, especially on the US. Uh, I'm not sure I'm going to agree with Danielle DiMartino Booth with last September, but I do think the U.S. is in recession. I think it's masked by the so-called strong labor market. I think post-COVID labor hoarding just makes labor alone a bad measure. And the labor consumer is this sort of one-legged stool that people keep saying makes the economy so strong. But almost everything else is negative. I mean, the LEI down 19 months in a row. Uh, the bank credit, uh, just you know, thing after thing, federal revenues, just chart after chart, number after number, uh, inventories. I mean, just all kinds of things. You look at these things and they're all screaming recession. And many of them, the moves are so vertical, they look like 2008. And yet, no, no, everything's fine because the labor market's so strong and the consumer's still buying. So I'm, I'm deeply skeptical. And I also think like, you know, even that is linear thinking, you know, how are things going? But history is often not linear. And I think that going from zero or near zero for record length of time to 500 plus basis points, I still think the Fed's not done breaking something. So two, way, two ways of raining on the parade there, Guy. Yeah, fantastic. Michael, fo following up with, with what you said as well, and sort of, you, you, you sort of segregated the world into three areas. It sounded like you have the US, you have Europe, and then what's called the Asia. East Asia. Um, with the Asia being somewhat lukewarm, actually, not cold, because everybody's predicting a recession in China or a depression even uh, massive, like the real estate market is under massive attack or in trouble. Um, wh where's the difference? Like, where's the, like, why do you see different, let's call it the heat, why does the heat maps look so different for the different regions? And what is, why is Asia standing out? Well, I, I would say if you look at the what's different in each of the regions, I mean, number one is that my, let's say, slightly more optimistic view of the U.S. is simply because the U.S. is running a hugely loose fiscal policy right now. And you're looking at a wealth effect, a still a positive wealth effect from the stock market and from real estate just just about um, on the consumer. So I think that's actually an interesting driver in the longer term. I'd be a little bit more skeptical about the long-term growth rate of the US economy, but the cycle we're talking about now, which I'm more positive on. If you look at Europe, Europe hasn't had that support from fiscal policy for sure. There's a lot more talk about austerity, particularly here in Germany right now again, uh, which has to be absolutely the wrong policy, but nonetheless it's being spoken about. And monetary policy has clearly been tightened across the world, which has been a, a damper on growth. But the key point about the future is looking at China. China is likely to be a, a lead indicator. Uh, too many people are writing China off. I'm not discounting the long-run fundamental problems the Chinese economy has got. In my view, it is going the same direction as the Soviet Union, so this is not a great story, right? But notwithstanding, the Chinese economy can still see cycl strong cyclical growth in the next two years if they throw enough money at the system. And the People's Bank of China is injecting a lot of money. Since June of this year, they've injected 4 trillion yuan, that's half a trillion US dollars, into Chinese money markets. And the PBOC is critical for the tempo of the state-owned industries. And China is still very dependent on this sector of the economy. 
Look at the iron ore price. Why is the iron ore price going up so much? It's telling you something about the health of the Chinese economy. You said throwing money at the system. Uh, actually, problem. let me jump in oh, on yeah, that, if I may. Yeah. And I just saw something about almost another half a trillion of new impetus, specifically uh, real estate focus, which is you know, a big problem for China. And a key point, and I am bearish on the global economy too, but maybe to lend Michael a little support here. Remember, there's a huge difference. If the United States wants to throw money at a problem, which it is, it has to print it or borrow it if it can or basically make it up. Either way, it's really inflationary. China actually has the money in the bank. Or, I mean, they might have to sell some U.S. treasuries. But they actually have all these massive foreign reserves. If they want to throw a half a trillion dollars at something, they actually have the half a trillion dollars. So it, it's not the same as the U.S. saying, now, where do we get this money from? Uh, so the economic consequences are going to be different. Recession has been a big topic as well and feels like, and we, we talked about this before in the record button, you mentioned 2025, which is interesting because all the commentators predicted a recession already for later this or this year in 2023. Now it's April, May, um, and throwing money at the problem seems to be one of the solutions. We have Chips Act, Inflation Reduction Act, and whatever act you want to name, probably. But uh, is that the solution? Or is that or is that fixing the problem? Because we're seeing 4.9% GDP debt in the news. <laughs> you want to go first on that one, Michael? Well, I, you know, I would say, what, okay, if you talk about next year, what, uh, what's up Janet's sleeve? We don't know. <laughs> but I think what you've got is the most overtly political Treasury Secretary I've seen in a long time. And I don't think they, they won't have an accident in the economy in a very sensitive election year. So if you look at something which is a, a wonkish number, but in the Treasury General account in the, on the Federal Reserve's balance sheet, that has built up, been built up substantially now. So there's a lot of leeway for the Treasury to spend extra money without having to uh, the risk of going to the markets or actually raise more. Uh, they are raising money, but again, there's a little twist in this, that Janet is raising money through the bill market, where it's very easy to sell bills. Everybody wants a short-term bill, US Treasury bill. Uh, they're not so keen on coupons. In other words, longer dated debt, such as the long bond. And we saw in the last auction that uh, the, the long bond did not sell terribly well then. Uh, the Federal Reserve had to come back and actually take up the remnants. So I think what you've got is a situation whereby there is scope for more fiscal policy easing. And in my view, we need to be very cognizant of the fact that this is, on some people's accounts, the loosest fiscal policy uh, that's been run since World War II. We're, we're, or lower, maybe you can chime in okay. there. Like. I, I wanted the erudite version oh. first so I can weigh yeah. it in with my axe here. <laughs> and just say, you know, I've already said that I think the U.S. is in recession and it's masked. I have, I'm on the record, I'm one of those ones who thought that we would see the recession become undeniable by anybody rational and not political anyway by the end of this year. And I only have a couple of weeks left to be right. It's still possible. Um, but if not, if it does slide into Q1, Q2 next year, I don't, I don't think that materially matters that much for the big picture. You know, if you're a gold bug or if you're a gold stock investor, um, to the degree that it matters actually it matters right now because we're in tax law season. We're just about to go into tax law season, and the stocks are hated. The metal is doing fine. The stocks are just as low as they could be at $300 gold, and that's actually a fantastic opportunity. We're looking at, I think, um, you know, p people, long-suffering gold bugs are tired of another buying opportunity. But in terms of taking our conversation from academic to practical, what to do, I actually think this is immediately actionable because of all these questions and things not going the way we thought they would and you know why wasn't inflation better for gold why isn't gold five thousand dollars an ounce all this stuff there's i think right now we're looking at a tremendous opportunity in the weeks immediately ahead to buy some of the some great companies at ridiculously low prices i think that's fantastic and I'll go, you, you don't know me, Mike, You're not, you haven't, we haven't met before this conversation, but Kai knows I'm not the sort of person who makes these bold predictions or price targets. That's not the way I do things. But I feel exceptionally strong about this. I think the U.S. recession will become undeniable soon, if not by the end of this year, soon. And I think that's going to be fantastic for gold. And I think it'll also be inflationary because I think the powers that be will respond with even more fiscal, fiscal, don't forget fiscal, as well as monetary easing. I think the money helicopters are being loaded right now, and they're going to be let loose as soon as they're trouble. And that's going to be fantastic immediately for safe haven assets and particularly monetary metals. And then down the road when it sparks the next inflation for other commodities and the industrial metals too will come back. So I think this is important. It's not an academic conversation. I think this is material for the coming year where we're going. 
And right now, like right now, and it's particular for gold, I, even sorry, silver bugs, we don't know yet how silver is going to react. But I think this is really an interesting time right now. Yeah, I, absolutely. I mean, I think if you want to put it in a nutshell, not another way of looking at this is to say, look, what matters for industrial metals is China and the People's Bank of China. If they stimulate the economy, industrial price, metal prices will go up. And then if you look at the gold price, precious metal prices, that's all about the Federal Reserve. Is the Federal Reserve in a position where it's going to expand liquidity? My view would be they're doing it already. Okay. That's what I think if you look at the numbers in detail, they are. They're adding liquidity to the system. They've been doing that pretty consistently for the last 12 months. Call that a stealth easing if you like, but it's in more increasing liquidity. Actually, one of the questions I wanted to ask you, how does that show up? Because they're not calling it, of course, quantitative easing. And officially well, and in fact, they're rolling off the balance sheet and M2 is falling. So, and yeah. Officially, they're running a QT scheme. I mean, yeah. a quantitative tightening scheme where credit is loosened, but then they jump in again and buy bonds or uh, jump into the treasury auction and pick up slack. Yeah, I think the, the, I mean, the answer would be, if you look at the Fed balance sheet, the headline balance sheet, it's going down. I mean, I'll come quietly on that. That's not the point. Because a lot of the items that make up the balance sheet are not liquidity creating. What you need to do is to look within the balance sheet and find those liquidity elements. And if you pour over the H4.1 release every week of the Federal Reserve, which, you know, sadly I have to do, but if we look at that, <laughs> what, you, what you find is that the liquidity elements of the, of the Fed, and that's Fed liquidity, is growing. Uh, it's been expanding for about a year now. Uh, it's been doing it for various reasons, whether it's the reverse, fall in the reverse repo account, uh, whether it's uh, more lending uh, because of uh, primary credit, in other words, um, discount window lending, whether it's bank support because of SVB, all these elements add up, but they're important. They have money going into the system. And you can see it as an end result in terms of reserves of the banks that are held at the Federal Reserve. U.S. commercial banks' balances at the Federal Reserve are on a rising trend. Okay? They've, been, they've been over $3 trillion pretty much for a year now. Okay? And they're now currently about 3.3 trillion. Now that is a that is a gently rising um, data series. And if you want an idea of Fed liquidity, watch that data. Let me jump in with another thought on this because I I agree. It's it, fundamentally the driver is the Fed. Shouldn't be, but it is. And and then carry down through the DXY. But this brings me to the confounding variable. You know, here we are in Frankfurt, Germany. Just this morning, we get the negative GDP print for Germany. And the Eurozone, you know, the numbers are looking pretty grim. You know, you've said cool to going towards icy. Um, and in, in this recent context, the Fed driven world, right? Gold is actually correlated with the Euro a lot. And so when the dollar is going up, the Euro is going down, so is gold. Any alternative to the dollar, they're both alternatives to the dollar. So it's not like somehow a cooling European economy is bad for gold, but it appears to be good for the dollar, which is therefore bad for gold. If gold is priced in dollars, which unfortunately for now it is, right? The, the, I, I don't like to call it the gold price. I call it the gold dollar exchange ratio. I think gold is money. It, and like any money, you can exchange it for dollars at different rates over time. So what I'm saying is, even though it sounds like we're agreeing about where the Fed is going and where the dollar is going in time, in the nearest term, Again, forget about inevitable or imminent. Like what's happening right now is it looks worse here in Europe than it does in the U.S. The U.S. still has this, what I think is an illusion of your strength in the economy. Whereas in Europe, it looks like it's going to hell in a handbasket right now. That's bearish euro, bullish dollar, and therefore bearish alternatives to dollars. So we could still see some headwinds here until either we pay the price, pay the piper for the Fed's actions and that linear economic slowing kicks in, or I'm right, the Fed breaks something else and suddenly, you know, right? Can, can the Federal Reserve afford to break something in an election year? Well, can they prevent it? You know, the powers that be might want to. I get it. You know, if certainly Yellen is out there, you know, miss no more crises in my lifetime, is out there saying, I see no sign of recession. Like, <laughs> 19 months of negative LEI. No, don't see that. You know, don't see any sign of recession. So they'll be out there saying, yeah. you know, exercising their jawbone. But at the end of the day, reality matters. And you've got, despite the Fed's protestations, uh, inflation expectations are starting to come unglued. The latest Michigan survey shows significantly higher short and long-term inflation expectations. That's curving up, and that's got to be worrisome. And the other one that I like is 
Um, if you look at the long-term unemployment chart, it, you know, we're talking about this illusory strength, but it starts to curve up right as you go into recession, and then the unemployment goes way up mm -hmm. in the recession. You know, I get it. The unemployment recession makes sense. But it doesn't start until after you're recognized in the recession. So you can't just say, oh, unemployment is great. It's True. always great before the recession, it's a, it's, right? It's, it's, it's a lagging indicator. But, but yeah, but the point is that you look at it and it starts curving up into that recessionary yeah. period. And that appears to be what's happening right, right. now. Okay. But then, you know, if you, if you want some alternative data, look at the, uh, the quarterly uh, CEO survey in the U.S. That's turned up for two quarters running now. If you look at yeah, the, after a year of negative revisions and beating lowered expectations, well, it's, it's formed a trough, but it's, it's picking up. Okay, you look I'll at give the, you that the one. ISM survey that's picking up. Okay, I had a blip last month, but it's turning. Uh, if you look at the uh, the SLU survey, which is senior loan officers, yeah, yeah. that actually picked up uh, last quarter when everyone was saying it was going to go down again. So you're looking at inflections and in a lot of these leading indicators. So I'd say that you know the the certainty of recession or deep recession is certainly not there now. On the, on the other question, which is the inflation one, if you take inflation, okay, I, I grant you that inflation is probably going to be volatile, uh, and I'm not you know, suggesting that we're going to be back to deflation or anything. But if you look at uh, break-even inflation rates, they've been remarkably steady, which is telling you something about maybe the market's confidence in what the Fed is doing in that regard. But at the end of the day, I'm sure we're on the same page of saying the Federal Reserve is probably going to have to ease substantially in 2024. Yes. At, at the end of the day. For different reasons. And I, but I'm going to go out on a limb and say I think they're going to be forced to. Like, it won't be linear. Something will happen, whether they want it to break or not. Uh, yeah. And, and SLU's surveys, CEO opinions, these are softer data in my view. You look at, say, the bankruptcy rates. We were already, year to date, bankruptcies like higher than we've had since the global financial crisis. You know, things like that. These are harder numbers in my view. Mm -hmm. And and team soft landing is just like, I'm not listening, I'm not listening. <laughs> and okay, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm looking at, you know, one-sided on some of the data. But at the very least, dear audience, you know, if people are just saying there's no sign of trouble, there's nothing to worry about, you can't take that at face value. They There are at least signs of things to worry about. Fantastic. You don't even need me, guys. It's, it's, it's <laughs> it's awesome a good conversation. But I think, you know, the interesting question, uh, come back to your point about uh, looking at the gold price in dollars rather than other currencies. If you're a Japanese investor, you'd have had a fantastic run in gold this year. Yes, or almost anything else. In yes. anything else. But yep. yen gold has gone up a lot. And one of the things, one of the big changes in the world economy is happening right now in Japan, where I think yes. unambiguously... Yes. We're on the same seeing, page on that. Yes. We are seeing a lot of the, inflation. And... and Yes, it was just came up. It went pop back up again today. It just came out. Well, last night it's in yeah. Japan. Yeah. yeah. So, so this is an interesting thing too because, you know, we Japan was so boring for so long. People almost forgot how big a swing factor that can be, and how that plays back into the dollar. I, mean, I wouldn't call it an exogenous shock exactly, but maybe an overlooked variable that hasn't been given the weight it deserves, and it could really change the balance of many of these things that you know we've been looking at in recent years. Interesting times. It's an oriental shock. There you go. <laughs> no, for Dan, I want to talk quickly more in the last five minutes on the, on the connection between the US dollar and gold price itself. Right? Because you, you said in your talk as well, like if gold shoots up, everything else has to go down. It doesn't work any other way. So, so what, what is your view there when you say that gold is going up? Do you see a scenario where both gold and US dollar go up like we've seen really October for, for a couple of weeks where both were perceived as a safe haven investment? Or is there a general decoupling? And to what level would the dollar have to sink for gold to actually break out and uh, mark, mark a new high? Is there a direct uh, coefficient that you could use almost? Okay, well, let, let, you... let me try and answer that. I mean, <laughs> I think the, um, I mean, the first thing to say is it isn't necessarily the case that, uh, that, you, that if gold goes up, the US dollar has to come down. That has been historically more often, occurred more often than not, I accept, but it's not necessarily given. And I think that uh, if you look forward, my view would be that the US dollar among the paper currencies uh, basically become, is an outperformer. Um, it's going to perform better than the euro, better than the yen, uh, better than the Chinese currency over the, over the medium term. Because I think we're still very much in a dollarized world, whether we like it or not, but that's, that's the reality. Uh, and that comes back to the power and the strength of the US financial system. If you say to me the US financial system is going to be eclipsed, I'll come quietly and say, therefore, the dollar will be eclipsed. 
But once it's part of this financial system, I think the dollar continues uh, to be a stronger currency uh, relative to other paper units. Gold is a different question. My view on gold is that the gold price is going up substantially in dollar terms and more substantially in other currency terms, simply because there has to be a lot of monetization going on uh, worldwide. Otherwise, there's got to be a lot of money printing. And that's because there is so much debt out there. And the only way you can roll debt is by printing more money, creating liquidity. And that's the name of the game. And just watch it unfold over the next few years. So do you have a follow up on that? Yeah, I'm, I agree. Actually, I think that's a, a pretty good analysis. He's got more white hair than I have, so I shouldn't give him permission to be right. But, but I'm just saying, I, I agree. That makes sense to me. But I also have to say, you know, things have gone wonky in the last year. So the stronger relationships we've seen before have broken down. The strongest correlate with gold since 1971 hasn't been the dollar, or, you know, before the DX, before the euro, you know, it's been real rates. And even that has broken down. In the more recent times, nominal rates have a higher correlation than real rates. It's, and it kind of makes sense. When you nail rates at zero, that you get a lot of noise there. Like, that's not a real number anymore. So long established relationships have been changing. Uh, but historically, you know, over the five decades of the dollar gold ratio being free to travel, it, it, it's been rates that have been the most highly correlated driver. So I, I don't want to just all be the dollar, but if, you know, the Fed affects both, which is why I agree that the Fed ultimately is the driver here. So this brings me to Ronnie Struffalo's favorite chart, which is um, Fed tightening cycles versus gold. And you look at where the Fed tightening cycles stop and then they start going down. And those, like, like in the last five instances, they all correlate. All of them, there's no exception with gold going higher. And they're substantial moves. So now we're looking at, you know, Fed tightening, it's flattening. In all of the last ones, the next move is down. And in all of the last ones, gold goes up. And we're starting at a $2,000 base. So what happens? You know, it doesn't take much to get a new all-time high. You know, a 10% move here is 2,200. You know, that makes headlines everywhere around the world. And then people start paying more attention. And in a world where you've got two hot wars that could potentially, either one could lead to World War III, right? And other things to worry about. I'm not predicting World War III. I'm just saying this is not the sort of world where people feel safe and they don't need to have any kind of safe haven asset or protect. In a world like that, where basically nobody owns gold, except for a few of us weirdo gold bugs, a small shift, a small allocation, you've heard Rick Rule say this, you go from essentially nothing to a historical average of gold allocation of a couple percent. And that vastly, vastly increases the investment demand for gold. So in a world like that, where you look at a very real shot at new all-time highs, even just nominal ones. And there's a potential for the market to get irrationally exuberant over the price of gold. So I find it interesting. It's not a promise, but it's a world where I don't want to miss that. And if I could just quickly throw in, the other yellow metal is in an interesting place like that. I know we're here at the Deutsche Gold mess, but uranium right now, well, it's just quadrupled or more. And it's starting to get in headlines in Bloomberg and places that never even could spell uranium before. So there's a potential for a flavor of the day there too, yeah. which is quite we interesting. We talked about that in New Orleans. Like, what does it take for to bring gold back on the map? Yeah, like we're at two thousand dollars and nobody talks about it. I think twenty two hundred would do it. Yeah, I mean, no, we we talked about fifty two hundred dollar move on a daily would would yeah. make a difference because then journalists would look at it. Bloomberg would write yes. headlines about it. Yeah, yeah. Right? Michael, I'm, I'm a little worried taking this conversation, which was fantastic, down the wrong path now. But I do have to ask you a bit for a bit of a forecast as well. Like, what do your models tell you? Where where are things headed for the gold price? just to put a bow around the conversation, hoping not to discredit everything we just said. <laughs> well, I think, okay, let, let, let me try, let me try and nail, nail this down because, I mean, my, my view is, you know, you could say how far can you, can you drive a car? Well, it depends how much for you got in the tank. So, you know, if there is a, a lot of liquidity in the system, the gold price is going to keep running. Now, I would envision that in the next, uh, each of the next two years, you're going to see global liquidity expanding at about 10%. Given the fact that gold tracks global liquidity, you've got to expect a 20% uplift for the gold price uh, over the next two years. Fantastic. 2,400. Yep. Awesome. Just had to do the math. Easy, be easy precise. Math. Yep. Um, fantastic conversation. Gentlemen, thank you so much for your time. Thanks so much for joining us here in Frankfurt for coming all the way. Um, Michael, where can we find more of you? Uh, well, you can look. I've got a Twitter with a handle of uh, Cross Border Cap. Uh, I've got a Substack which has got the title Capital Wars. Uh, we've got a website, crossbordercapital.com. Fantastic. Lobo, where can we find more of you? Independentspeculator.com.
Fantastic. Thank you very much. Awesome, gentlemen. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody else, thank you so much for tuning in. I absolutely love this discussion. I didn't have to do much. It was great. <laughs> and I uh, hope you enjoyed it as well. If you haven't done so, hit that subscribe button and uh, we'll be producing a lot more content here at the Deutsche Gold Messe. Thanks so much for tuning in.